Kıraathane İstanbul Edebiyat Evi'nden hepinize iyi akşamlar, merhaba. Edebiyat konuşmaları serimizde bu akşam çok sevdiğimiz bir yazarla Valeria Luiselli ile birlikteyiz. Bu akşam amacımız Valeria Luiselli'ye mümkün olduğunca geniş söz ve konuşma imkanı tanımak. Edebiyat Evi'nin bütün ekibi burada fakat biz ekip olarak çok da böyle konuşmaya hakim olmak istemiyoruz. Valeria Luiselli'nin Türkiye'de çok fazla, çok sayıda onu çok seven okuru var. Sizler belki göremiyorsunuz ama şu anda 100 kişi kadarız ve sayımız da artacaktır diye tahmin ediyorum. Şimdi izninizle kendisine hoş geldin demek istiyorum. Valeria, hello. Hello everybody. Yes. Uh, I, I hope to hear your voices and questions later. It's strange to say hello everybody and not really, not really see you. Um, But it's, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you so much for inviting me. I wish I were physically in Istanbul. I haven't been to Istanbul in many years and I am longing to return. Um, and thank you also um, in advance to the simultaneous interpreters. I greatly admire and respect your job. And I don't want to put you in the awkward position of having to <laughs> thank yourselves, but I, I really wanted to, to thank you. Um, so before I... Um, read the brief, the brief lecture that I have prepared yes. today. I am going to, um, are you having trouble hearing me? Because I hear Yasmin. Yes, we're hearing you uh, perfectly well. Okay. Um, so before I read that lecture that I've prepared, um, I am going to play a few minutes of an audio clip that is related to what I'm going to read. And it's just part of an ongoing um, piece that I'm working on right now, a piece which is uh, like a sonic essay, like a sound essay, um, in which there are several different female voices speaking. Um, so I'm gonna play that now. Um, I think it's not going to be translated, just uh, you can just listen listen to to it it's it doesn't have a lot of text uh the text is mostly about fear in the creative process what is fear and what we work with um or how we work with or against fear when we are uh involved in the creative process um so here here we go i hope the audio is good if you can signal me yasmin or whoever i am seeing now like that yeah, this the, sure. the that the, it's good or not good, let, just let me know, so. Yeah, I, I, I, I was frozen myself. I was off myself. I fell off the uh, transmission for a minute. I have very shaky internet, so sorry about that. Don't worry. Uh, but we hear you fine. And uh, I don't know if you guys already went over that, but if not, I would just like to say, or uh, remind everyone, because I think we have some English speakers among us who might not have seen the title advertised in English tonight. Uh, we advertise it in Turkish, but the title of this conversation tonight is Literature and Politics and When Does Fiction Breathe? And of course, this is very much inspired by you, Valeria, by something you have said when you were talking to The Guardian, I think, about Lost Children's Archive and, and how, you know, writing about such a political matter, something that you were so angry about, mm -hmm. was difficult for you at the beginning and you you kind of felt that the text was bogged down with politics and it was it was stiff and it wasn't breathing and then you changed certain things in it and and something marvelous uh, came out so hopefully we will be um, hearing from you tonight uh, the story of, of that process also a little bit and uh, we will follow up with questions so it's all yours now all right let me know if just give me a thumbs up if you can hear uh, the what I'm about to play and I'm playing three two one now
family lexicon. Maybe this is the place from which most women can engage in political thought and produce creative work. I cannot look at the world from the vantage point of a free, solitary gaze. That would be mere literary artifact. My entire adult life has been weaved in the messy, intricate, and beautiful mess of a shifting family, a community. It is there from inside that space that I can look out the window. But still, when you look out the window, you're just you looking out the window. Like in the morning, when I walk into your room, and you're just sitting around there alone with your cafecito. What are you most afraid of in old age, Ma? Perder la mente. I've been thinking about Dorothea Lang. There's some video footage of her talking to her son when she's trying to prepare for her first retrospective at the MoMA. It's 1964, and she's going to be the first woman photographer ever to have a solo show there. She has to revise a lifetime of work, thousands of negatives and prints, and choose. Her son tells her that she needs to just get it done, hurry up, prepare, and stop doubting. A bit is cut out from the footage. But then we see her telling him that it's not really modesty it on her part. It is not really modesty on my part. Don't mistake it. It's not modesty. It's that I'm afraid. But what was she afraid of? I don't think she was afraid of anything in particular. Maybe not getting it right not going deep enough, I'm not sure. Well, I don't know what I'm afraid of. Maybe as you grow older, you will know. I'm afraid of my relationship failing, afraid of not being able to protect the little ones, afraid of losing touch with myself. I'm afraid of not being congruent. Fear jellyfish. Fear of not meeting my own expectations. Perder claridad. Fear of people and things disappearing. Fear of a world in which nothing matters and everything vanishes. Fear of a world in which language and thought cease to become a space between us. Thought may be a deeply personal, internal, at times solitary process, but it is also the most collective of activities. It is collective because it is done with words and those words belong not just to the person who uses them, but to an entire linguistic community. Or perhaps words don't belong to a community either. Nobody can own language as much as they are the very threads that bind us to one another. They give us foundational myths. They give us stories. They produce philosophy, friendship, criticism, politics, humor. Words are the midwives of social revolutions and change. Words may bind us, but they can also become weapons against us 
and particularly against the less powerful and more vulnerable members of a society. In the hands of the powerful, be it the political or economic elite or the racial or military supremacy, words can become a particularly potent, cruel weapon. If the objective of power is to remain as it is or to further consolidate, that is to protect the statu quo or transform even into tyranny, everyday language will be used to perpetuate imbalances. A racial elite, for example, will protect the statu quo, calling everyone else that is not like them a minority, a term itself apparently harmless and merely numerical in its primary connotation, but which carries another set of associations that both reflect and preserve imbalances of power and of political capital. Then there is the word illegal, for example, which when used to refer to a sector of a population who does not have a passport or a visa, becomes an ideological weapon against an already disenfranchised group of people. It converts individuals into criminals and justifies political and institutional violence against them, detention, incarceration, denial of medical attention, denial of due process. The word is still today used as common currency, despite the fact that it is dehumanizing, despite it's exercising a brutal psychological violence on another individual's mind, despite the fact of it being completely nonsensical. What even is the word illegal person? We cannot assume that words are just there for us to use selfishly, irresponsibly, like an inexhaustible resource. Thoughtless use of words, especially those that contain complex meanings and various connotations may serve to perpetrate and perpetuate violence. It is our responsibility therefore as members of a linguistic community to engage in the daily task of thinking and rethinking about the kind of violence that words exert and that easily goes by unnoticed. We are all responsible for keeping words and the complex tapestry we are endlessly doing and undoing with them across decades and centuries, safe from the possibility of being transformed in, into instruments of violence. The only way to do that is to think constantly and with a sense of collectivity about the words that circulate among us. And it really is crucial that everyone remains actively involved in the ongoing process of revising and renewing the language we use, because that is the only way to ensure that words will not be hijacked by those in power. It is the only way to ensure that our minds will not be dominated by power be that power a tyrannical political leader, political parties owned by lobbyists, or the companies that surveil us through the internet. The Spanish philosopher Maria Zambrano, exiled to Latin America during Francisco Franco's dictatorship in Spain in the 1930s, devoted much of her writing to thinking about what happens to words and to thought in times of totalitarian regimes. She writes about the loss of a sense of community in the suffocating art atmosphere of those regimes and the impossibility to live at all. I quote, under such conditions, when we want to relate to our fellow men and women who find themselves in a similar situation, it is impossible to live with others and consequently to live at all. Zambrano, like did Hannah Arendt or Primo Levi, as well as many others who had to flee into exile in the midst of persecution also wrote about the vital role that thought plays in undoing the harm that totalitarianism causes in both an individual's interiority and in his or her capacity to relate to others, to coexist with others. And I quote, one of the essential functions of thought, Zambrano writes, is to make the atmosphere breathable, to free human beings from asphyxia, which is caused by a lack of inner space, 
when conscience becomes filled with shadows, with uncertainty, when the shadows of others and our own shadow have made our inner space, the primary space in which we move and breathe, excessively opaque. The triad, thought, interiority, community, is a revindication of what political violence seeks to take away from people. Individuals living in a violent and authoritarian state feel more and more distanced from each other, mistrustful, confused, more and more isolated. The means by which power achieves this is controlling discourse, making concepts opaque, instilling fear and uncertainty, filling us with noise. Survival depends on our capacity to think clearly and freely, and of course, collectively. A quote from Ursula K. Le Guin here. Hard times are coming, Le Guin says. When, will we, when we will be wanting the voices of writers who can see alternatives to how we live, how we live now, and can see through our fear-stricken society and its obsessive technologies to two other ways of being, and even imagine some real grounds for hope. We will need writers who can remember freedom, poets, visionaries, the realists of a larger reality. We live in capitalism, its power seems inescapable, but then so did the divine right of kings. Any human power can be resisted and changed by human beings. I would add human imagination. Resistance and change often begin in art, close quote. Fiction, I think, is a kind of drive a commitment to collectively reimagine the narrative of our everydayness, to work our way through despair and senselessness in order to give shape to words, create new thoughts with them, and find new meaning over and over again. Fiction threads together the collective narratives in which we live and which make life richer, more layered, more complex, and also sometimes more beautiful. Fiction requires a combination of insight and foresight, of looking at a present situation and reaching deep within oneself in order to imagine its many possible developments. Fiction is also something quite like a bodily intuition or an embodied knowledge, something we feel when our minds are able to pierce through the mesh of the present and imagine the future. Sometimes what we see when we try to peer into that future is too painful, shocking, or simply unimaginable, abysmal. But we have to look at it anyway and make something of it, make something with it. The word fiction, in fact, comes from fingere, which means to shape, to give form, and originally to mold something out of clay. Fingere implies the action of making or rather giving form. It is not inventing something that is not true, but rather giving shape to something that was already there, even though not everyone could or would dare to see it. In these times of isolation and doubt, we try to give form to this new sense of time. My family and I spend the afternoons planting seeds in germination containers and flower beds, beans, corn, squash, tomatoes, wildflowers, I usually go to bed late, but not too late. Almost always writing, other times just roaming the house, cleaning here and wiping there. So much dust always, kitchen to bedroom to living room like a balloon that gradually deflates. Finally, exhausted, defeated, I sit in the dining room table and stare at the books on the shelves, as if by just staring at them, they might somehow fill this new silence with a more meaningful quietness. I approach a shelf, take a book that I read and underlined long ago, open it. And I do indeed find solace in these gentle companions that live in our bookshelves. As Quevedo, Francisco de Quevedo once wrote, retirado en la paz de estos desiertos, con pocos pero doctos libros juntos, vivo en conversación con los difuntos y escucho con mis ojos a los muertos. Or in English translation, Withdrawn into the peace of these deserts, along with some books, few but wise, 
I live in conversation with the deceased and listen to the dead with my eyes. Sometimes too, my daughter and niece and I read out loud to each other for company, for a better sense of being together maybe, beyond cooking and eating meals and cleaning the house. We read to each other the way one seeks company around a fireplace to be alone together. We've been reading W.E.B. Du Bois, Marguerite Durad, James Joyce, and even a vampire series, the title of which I will never confess. In any case, I can say without a hint of doubt that without books, we would not have made it through these months. If our spirits have found renewal, if we have found strength to carry on, if we have maintained a sense of enthusiasm for life, it is thanks to the world that book that books have given us. One early morning, some weeks ago, I was reading an essay titled Writing by Marguerite Duras when my daughter came into my bedroom. She's in the threshold of childhood and adolescence, still sleeps with her stuffed animals, but also uses face toner and has moods that swing wildly. As she joins me in the bed and cuddles, I notice her feet are enormous, her arms impossibly long and her pajamas definitely too small. Is her last milk tooth going to fall during this period? I wonder, her last childhood days confined to these old white walls. She asks what I'm reading and I tell her I'm reading Dura and read the first sentences out loud for her to listen. Quote, it is in a house that one is alone, not outside it, but inside. Inside the house, one is so alone that one can become lost. That makes no sense, my daughter says. No one can get lost inside a house unless you're an ant or a spider. I feel a strange, maybe selfish comfort in confirming that, yeah, she's still little, still impervious to certain forms of fear, certain metaphors. Recently for a project, I had interviewed some women in my family about what they feared most. My mother said, perder claridad, to lose clarity. My daughter said, I'm afraid of jellyfish. My younger niece said, expectations. My older niece said, I'm afraid of my relationship failing, losing love. And what are you afraid of, mama? My daughter asked me. I'm not sure, what am I afraid of? After devoting years to something as improbable as a novel, years getting lost inside one's own house, inside one's soul, mining memory to retrieve any tiny detail, years of sleepless nights, advancing word by word, accumulating only unanswered questions, fears, years of having to trust blindly that something as intangible as a sequence of sentences will eventually add up to a whole larger than its parts. After all that, the greatest gift a writer can receive is knowing that there is a community of minds and souls that bring a book into existence every time they open it and begin to read its pages. The world of Lost Children Archive, which for such a long time grew so quietly and privately inside me, is now a place that others also step into, where they can linger and be alone but not lonely and meet characters like the lost children who are traveling across a continent on their own aboard a beastly northbound train, as well as the characters Memphis and Swift Feather and their rather messed up parents, let's not judge them too harshly. Lost Children Archive is a novel about the depths of childhood solitude and children's boundless imagination, the fragile intensity of family ties, about tensions between history and fiction and the complex intersections of political circumstances and personal lives. But more than anything, it is a novel about the process of making stories, of threading voices and ideas together in an attempt to better understand the world around us. It begins with two parents telling stories, their children physically, but also metaphorically riding in the backseat of the family car, but then shifts to the children's narrative, to them becoming the voices that tell us the story of the fucked up and beautiful world that we are always fictioning, as in making and reshaping. What am I afraid of? I am afraid like any adult of many things, 
of loss, of sickness, of not being able to provide for those who depend on me, of political violence, of the police. But I'm particularly afraid of our spirits becoming stagnant, of not having a narrative to believe in, of not having a common space in which to listen to each other and understand each other deeply. I'm afraid, in other words, of a world without imagination, without fiction, a world in which we do not share the collective space of thought. And so I guess I'm committed to that, to devoting my life to the very improbable art of fiction. Thank you very much. Yasmin, you're still muted. There we go. Sorry about that. Well, thank you for that wonderful speech. Um, you gave us a lot to think about, and I'm sure there will be many questions coming in. As promised at the beginning, uh, we're going to open it to the questions uh, at, at the very start, and then maybe Nilfar Kuyash and others from the Literature House also would like to join the conversation. But before I go to the questions, uh, I would like to recognize a few people. And I, I have seen uh, some prominent writers among, among the audience today, um, like Behce Çelik's name I saw, Yavuz Ekinci and Mevsim Yenici. And I'm sure there are many I haven't seen. So welcome to all readers, writers, editors, translators, everyone. But I would like to recognize uh, Sanem Sirer and Erol Aydın, your wonderful publishers here at Siren. It's thanks to them we read you in Turkish, and also thanks to, of course, Seda Ersavcı, who translates you from both Spanish and English. And I don't know if Seda is, is with us tonight, I but so. um, I, I would really you know, want to thank them on behalf of all of us reading you in Turkish. Um, and if they want to jump in and ask questions, of course, uh, they're welcome to any time. Um, when we were chatting before we went live, uh, Valeria told us that she would rather have you come and ask your questions in person on camera if you would like to do that. So please raise your hands. Lütfen elinizi kaldırın ve kameraya gelerek soru sormak istiyorsanız bu her zaman mümkün. Biz yardımcı olmaya çalışacağız ev sallayanlara bakarak. Now, if you could put perhaps uh, the camera on Valeria uh, and uh, I go to the written questions to begin with the written questions and I will try to go in order, Valeria. About the process of writing, asks Murat Dural. Sure. The right. Uh, you. okay. you're, you're following, you're after a voice to find the right voice. But, um, and in your literature, she sa he says, uh, we find the uh, the taste of uh, Latin literature, Latin American Latin literature, and the very pure and um, uh, very um, generous and, and um, honest way. You succeed in this, but the question is, how do you manage the problem of writing something that means a lot to you and also considering the writer? Uh, you know, um, he says, I, Valeria Luiselli is someone that inspires me a lot. And uh, we admire her very much. And we're hoping to see her in Istanbul. Um, he's actually asking you how you manage the challenge of uh, starting and doing it over and over again. It's success. Well, I think that, that um, more than anything, for me, it's uh, about how to man maintain a very uh, a deep and um, very vital connection to the material that I'm exploring when I'm writing. Um, and the, the hardest periods for me as a writer, but as a human being in general, I think are the periods after which I have 
finished a, a big project and there comes this kind of emotional um, like wasteland. I was going to say desert, but a desert is something that's alive and beautiful, but like a, a kind of emotional wasteland of not, um, of not being, of not being engaged in my imagination uh, to anything, um, to anything. And that period of, um, of, of certain, yeah, and creative dryness is very difficult for me. And it's not dryness, it's just like a period of, of not, not be, it's like a, it's a kind of exile from yourself, right? I think when you are deeply engaged with working on something, you have a very deep connection with, with your inner world and are in, maybe even more at peace with that world because even if it is often complicated and you are not necessarily always in a state of enjoyment on the contrary, but you're at least engaged with something. I think that the difficulty is when you step outside of that and um, until you find your way back in to, to yourself and to the project uh, or the, the questions or the world that, that you will be, in, be engaging with again. Um, that is a, what I think is most difficult to manage. And I think the only way to manage it is with enormous patience, right? With understanding that anything that is worth exploring and worthwhile in general takes its time to grow. Like it really does take its time and you have to kind of tend to it every day, even if it's a little bit before it starts giving any kind of fruit. Um, so I have no idea if I've answered your question, but since your question is about how, how to manage, <laughs> I think that's, that's a good, it's a, uh, yeah, it's a, it's a place. I think he also, he also means how success affects you. You're a successful writer now. It, I mean, I don't think okay it, with it or does it? I think success no, I don't know. I think success or no success, it would just be quite as difficult to write. Um, writing is so difficult. Uh, it's really, really difficult. Um, so maybe, yeah. I I have no um, I have like I have no regrets and frustrations about my work. You know, I I have a lot of frustration as I'm working often when it's not coming, right? But, um, but yeah. Right, that's great. So Mehmet Sharma asks, um, you are a critical light writer. You're, you're directing a, a very powerful criticism towards how the world is working at the moment. But we live in an age where fiction, like everything else, is very easily consumed. Um, uh, and um, there's a dilemma between being critical and the danger of writing to please the reader. Um, how do you, he's probably asking, uh, do you ever take into consideration the expectations of readers? How do you uh, ride this um, conflict and uh, the, the, the contradiction between uh, what you want to do and what the majority of readers expect. Do you ever think of the readers while you write? That's the question. You're muted. Um, and there's, a, there's an additional part to that question. Do you think the present political, social, historical problems are pushing literature outside the aesthetic domain. Mm. Um, no, no, I don't. I think, you know, um, for me, it's pretty clear how I relate to like literary culture, books in general, and entertainment culture. And there's like a thin line, but there's some kind of line for me. And I know that when I don't want to think, I watch a series uh, on one of these uh, 
horrid platforms <laughs> like Netflix. Um, and that when I went to think and I went, when I went to engage more deeply with, um, or just be alone and find some, find some deeper substance of things I, I read. Uh, and I think that maybe there's one, maybe one good thing about like the amount of like mass culture products we have nowadays, and especially with respect to entertainment, visual culture, is that it's very clear that, that it's literary fiction is more and more departed from that. And that is more and more departed from literary fiction. It's like really two complete different, mm -hmm. different worlds. And I think the readers of literature um, have always been not, not a great amount of people, but it doesn't, it doesn't matter. You know? it's, not, it's, not a, it's not a field in which I think anyone uh, is there doing their work in order to please uh, a massive audience, but but rather to to explore. I mean, I suppose that a lot of writers also write for the screen or thinking about being mm -hmm. eventually taken to the screen. Um, I have I um, I have a very very clear position, or I have had until now a very clear position about like my not my very little interest in in um, in fact my I make an effort. I've always made an effort to write books that cannot be filmed, um, that, that can't really be filmed. Um, or, that, <laughs> or, or, that. or if they are filmed, you would, they would have to be kind of destroyed uh, in order to be filmed. So like, for example, Lost, Lost Children Archive might, might be taken to the screen by an interesting female Mexican director that I'm, I'm, whose work I like. Um, but I know even her, like she's, she's so good, but even her, like there's no way to film this book, really. Uh, how do you film the elegy of the lost children inside the book? And without that, it doesn't, the book doesn't, it's not the same book, you know, it's, it doesn't fall apart, but it's not, it's just not the same book. So anyway, um, I'm, I'm very conscious of, of that in my work and the, with what I'm working on next is a kind of sound piece that is also, I'm very, I'm not, I really don't want it to be visual in any way, it's just a kind of sound piece about, about um, the history of violence in the US-Mexico borderlands from the 19th century till today, uh, in which a lot of uh, different female voices narrate. Um, the conditions that may not not they don't just simply reproduce violence on the in the storytelling. On the contrary, violence itself is not mimicked or reproduced. It's more like um, dis a discourse around what conditions made violence possible. Mm -hmm. uh, in particular, I mean, I I am focusing on different forms of accumulation of capital that have marked the borderlands from exploitation of land and extractivism and during mining to industrialization programs uh, in the 20th century between the two countries that created these kind of sweatshop mm -hmm. uh, culture that then led to the brutal femicides of Ciudad Juarez. And then more recently, surveillance culture and mass incarceration as, as, a, well, as, as part of the prison industrial complex that is a millionaire billionaire business in the USA, right? So it's, it's about that. And there's no, there, there's no way, <laughs> or I would never want to, to take that to a, like a, a space of visual entertainment, you know, quite, quite the contrary. Um, yeah. yeah, so you're one example of a writer who proves that political problems does not push fiction out of the aesthetic domain. Bravo, great short question from Andrew Finkel, who's a writer himself and a member of the Literature House. Where do you draw the line between fiction and nonfiction? And Yasimin, are you back? Am I going to hand over to you? Great oh, question. Yeah, I can, and yeah, nonfiction. Yeah. How do you draw the line? Between I'm muting fiction. myself. Yeah, fiction and nonfiction. Um, I mean, it's very clear to me when I am writing nonfiction that I can't just bring fiction into it. Uh, there's an ethical duty there, right? So it, when I wrote a book like Tell Me How It Ends, um there's there's just no no doubt about 
my my my responsibility toward a situation, to, toward the theme, toward a group of people whose lives I'm writing about, etc. When when working in fiction, however, um, I'm not very interested in that line. Um, I just think that it's for me. What I'm interested in is is process, right? And how uh, perhaps a more documentary process that is documenting the everyday conversations with people, overheard conversations or ones that were had at the dinner table or um, an instant uh, in your child's um, day, the kind of family lexicon that rises in the very uh, private kind of linguistic games of the family. Those things documented um, on on the first level then can become for me in many cases, uh, the beginning of fiction. But fiction in the sense that I was reading ear earlier, like fiction as as fingere, as like the, the act of molding clay, uh, giving it a precise shape, giving a precise shape to something that was already there. So the already there, I guess it's like whatever nonfiction is, but it's, but it's in giving it shape that you're already doing fiction. So no matter if it's with raw, material of everydayness, it's it's fiction all the time, right? And I guess one more thing I like about that particular etymological uh, origin of fiction and, and, the, and the image of clay is that like the, what you see in a clay form is not only the final shape that it takes, but also the the imprint, like the, almost the, the, the finger, the finger um, uh, prints of, the person who's molded it, right? So there is there's an impression upon the material that that is also particularly interesting to think about when thinking about fiction. Okay, uh, so there are two questions from Senor Zorer, and uh, I will ask them together to you. And one is, you know, when you're writing fiction, when you're molding that clay, uh, do metaphors uh, determine your flow. In other words, uh, does your story lead you to the metaphors or it is the metaphors which guide your story? That's the first one. And yeah, the second yeah. one is about uh, the discipline of writing for you. You know, what kind of a writer you are, I guess, uh, do you have a system of writing? Do you have a certain discipline of writing? Uh, two great questions. Thank you very much for them. Um, about uh, sort of if, if metaphors are um, the origin of of something, or maybe a place you would, or on the other hand, uh, a place to which you arrive after. Um, I think um, I think it's both. I think um, I think there's definitely m metaphors to which you can only arrive after exploring um, material, your material long enough. And, um, and once they appear, they themselves are generative of, of more, right? A metaphor is often something um, that has several layers um, and that which you can sort of unpack and, and, and, and, and it has that unpacking generates uh, a movement forward in story uh, or movement inward. I mean, it doesn't matter, but if it's forward or inward or which direction, but but um, a metaphor definitely can help to continue. Um, it's not the end of, it's not the end of something, but also a way in which what you've been saying can be rolled into something, but then can also be unfurled basically uh, or un unraveled. Um, and then in terms of, um, I guess you're asking about practice, what kind of writer? I don't know. I think that every time I write a new new book, new project, I have to learn all over again. Who the, who the fuck I am? <laughs> and like, how did, I think the, the first question that I asked myself, or one of like a question that's recurrent when I am working on something new is how the hell am I gonna do this? Like, I just don't know. It's like, I forgot, like I've been, publishing for 10 years and then I just forget. I forget how to do it again. And so the question is how the hell am I gonna do it? And then one day it's finished. And then the question is, how the hell did I do it? 
I have no idea. I was walking in the dark for five years and then something came out, you know, there's, um, but, but I, I don't mind how it's frustrating, but in a way, because I think um, it's frustrating in a way to not have a, an absolute clarity or, and, and like the feeling of accumulated maturity and experience. It's, it's, a, it's as if I don't mature anymore. I don't. And, um, but the good thing about it, I think, is that it, that forces me to, to never feel comfortable with any kind of formulaic um, um, yeah, method or it, it allows me, doesn't allow me to, to become comfortable in, in general. And so I have to look, and that also means that I have a lot of fun always. Like I, <laughs> I think for me, having fun with what I do, not in not in uh, the light, the lightness American fun, uh, not not even a, a party kind of, but just what I mean is like an enthusiasm, right? Uh, a deep engagement with with with what I am doing. I feel that because I never know how to do it how to engage with that material. I have to invent the rules. I don't know where I'm going. I don't know how I'm going to do it. And all of that gives me a kind of, um, the kind of thrill, the kind of enthusiasm that for me is absolutely necessary in order to be able to work. You know, I think there's many writers that I think um, I have just like um, this in insanely good discipline. No matter if what they're writing is incredibly boring to them, they will still sit down uh, and produce the same 10 pages every day, or they will write from 6 a.m. to 10 a.m. every day, like, no matter what. I am not quite like that, even though I do write every day. Um, but my discipline always has to consist in making sure that I am maintaining the fire of enthusiasm alive. Because if that goes out, I'm just not gonna sit. I'm just not gonna do it. Um, so that takes discipline too. And usually that discipline is more about continuing to read interesting things, continuing to find a relationship with archives, continuing to look for new forms, uh, etc. Wow, great answer, yes. Non-robotic discipline, Valeria, I'm going to be selfish now and ask you a question myself and then go back to the participants. Uh, there's lots to ask you, you know, your Mexican identity, the fact that you wrote your last novel in English, why did you, your relationship with sound. But more important than that, when I was reading your book, The Lost Children Archive, and then I was so interested then I ended up reading your other books as well. At first I was disappointed because from a intimate story of a family, The Lost Children Archive suddenly shifts into a mythical dimension. And then I realized that you're a writer who likes bending or challenging the rules of writing a novel. You know, you, you, you defy all the rules of fiction, you reinvent them. And uh, in another novels of, novel of yours, you, you quote the Argentinian writer, Alan Pauls. Uh, if I remember correctly, he said, fiction is a map of encounters and separations or something like that. And I realized that you're one of the writers of, of our present time who are reinventing the novel. Would you agree? You're not writing the expected novel, but something completely different. Um, I mean, um, I think I would, uh, it would sound incredibly presumptuous of me to think that to, to, to think that that is possible, even or that you know, and, and I don't actually uh, feel exactly that I'm reinventing anything. I, what I feel um, very clearly is kind of what I was saying earlier uh, is that I just don't, I, I don't, I don't like to follow rules. You know, I used to be a very rebellious teenager uh in a kind of brutal and destructive way and luckily at some point um my interior nerd uh took over my life maybe when i had children and, and i thought i was now responsible for others so i stopped engaging in and in, in all the things that <laughs> that 
that I did engage in that and were rebellious and destructive when I was a teenager. And maybe the only space in which I can feel rebellious now is <laughs> the very nerdy space of paragraphs. Um, and maybe, I mean, in that sense, yeah, I mean, I would never write a book in which I would was following any rules. Why would, like, why would I, I, honestly, what I feel is why would anyone do that? Um, why would anyone follow any kind of, because I mean, there are some rules, I teach them in, in the MFAs here and um, I don't know, even rules that like uh, our great, great, great, great grandfather, Aristotle <laughs> laid down and still people are using um, this kind of, uh, I don't know, phallic or, or not more than phallic, uh, um, uh, masculine idea of plot in which there is like a beginning and a climax. And then after the one climax, then it's over, you know? Um, I, I, I don't think of fiction that way at all. And I, I would never sit down and like think of uh, chapter one, chapter two, chapter three, what, what's that? You know, that's what that, how boring is that? Uh, so I don't know if it's about reinventing, but it is definitely about finding play, you know, finding yeah. play in what I do. And, you know, play, as Julio Cortázar, the writer, used to say, is a very serious thing. Like, playing is a very serious thing. You think about yeah. children and how they engage with play and game. I mean, they get really angry if, <laughs> if like, someone doesn't, like, I don't know, follow the rules of the invented game, you know? Like, there's, of course, some yeah. rules, follow, but you, you make them up, right? Um, so I, I, I, I do believe... I probably, I probably didn't express it well enough. I mean, you're changing the rules. You're innovative. That's probably something conscious, isn't it? Um, I mean, conscious in the sense that I, as I was saying, it's, it's, I, I'm just not going to write that other way. Cause I just wouldn't, I just, you know, I try, I tried at some point in the, um, I didn't try hard enough maybe, but when the pandemic began and, uh, I, <laughs> my daughter was very, uh, interested in reading all these vampire series, um, for like teenagers. Uh, I thought, you know, maybe I should just write a vampire. I always liked vampires when I was a girl. Like, I always found it a, an interesting uh, parallel world. I thought, I'm going to write some, like, commercial... I'm going to write a commercial vampire series under a pen name. I'm not going to say it's, it was me. <laughs> and I'm just going to do that during the pandemic because, you know, what the hell? Um, and it'll give me a space of absolute, like, mm, like being far away from all this terrifying world, and, and I'll just do that. And I tried and I found it impossible. Like I, I, st I, I tried, like I tried because there's this, it's a genre, it's genre fiction, no? So I thought, okay, like what could chapter one be about? I just could not, there was just no way that I could do it. Great, thank you. Over to Yasemin now. Okay, I will continue with the questions from the audience. And uh, there are, I think at least a couple waiting. I'll start with the one in English here. And uh, Furkan Günay says, uh, in Lost Children Archive, there is a reference to Wim Wenders' Paris, Texas, but also I think his other films like Kings of the Road and Alice in the City have some similarities with the book in some level, like Polaroid pictures, landscapes, and transformative journey. What do Wim Wenders' films mean for Lost Children Archive? And let me follow up this with, with, a, with a similar question. You just told us that you, you, you're trying to write in a way that cannot be filmed. You know, you're trying uh, kind of to avoid, although maybe your book will be made into a film now, but are you influenced or inspired by cinema in general? Does, does the cinematic narrative um, affect your writing at all? And also, in particular, of course, Wim Wenders' movies, as Furkan Gunai asked. Yeah, I think that I uh, am maybe more influenced by photography and by music. And I guess if you put the two together, film comes out. But, uh, but, uh, but I think, like, just in terms of what I look at and engage with while I'm writing is often much more photography than film. Uh, still photography and um, and I'm also a, I, I mean, I'm, a, I'm a frustrated dancer I was training to be a, a contemporary ballet dancer um, until I realized I had a very poor sense of of, um, of rhythm or I had it in my head but it couldn't translate 
naturally to to to my body so i mean imagine that good luck in trying to be a professional dancer that way so but but i i still draw a lot from dance and one of my favorite Wim Wenders films is his uh, documentary film on Pina Bausch um and just the way that he's able to represent dance on a screen which is a very difficult thing to do it's almost impossible right it's another one of those arts that should not be taken to the screen right uh and uh and yet he does it really well there's been that in paris texas i think really like like like the work of a lot of photographers that i mentioned in the book i guess i just mentioned everyone that has been, was influential to me in an instrumental to me in and in, in creating a, a more sensorial and emotional relation to a landscape that was otherwise very foreign to me, right? I mean, when we read about a city that we don't ever, that we don't yet know uh, or see interesting photographic work about it or interesting cinematographic work about it. And then we arrive one day at that city, it's, we kind of know it already, you know? We, we have a, a deeper emotional relation to it. Um, and in, in the very um, like emotionally, empty world of deep America for me, uh, the gaze of people like Wenders or Jim Jarmusch and the photographers I mentioned like uh, Robert Frank or Sally Mann or Dorothea Lang were fundamental to me to give me kind of a, a gaze, like a filter of gazes through which to look and maybe understand a little better. Okay. Um... Nilofar, should I continue? Yes, please. Okay, um, here's a question from Esra Akgemji, and uh, she's referring to the Spanish writer Javier Cercas, and he said that there wouldn't be any literature in a happy world. And Esra Akgemji is asking, if there weren't any tragedies in the world, there wouldn't be the great works of literature. And uh, if there weren't um, migrant, uh, lost migrant children in the world, your novel, your, your, your, your last novel wouldn't, wouldn't exist either. So do you feel, um, or, or let's say feeding on, in, in her words, feeding on tragedies, uh, does that cause a kind of existential crisis for you? Does that trouble you at all? And do you think there would be any function, any meaning to storytelling in a world without tragedies? Mm, it's a very beautiful question and very difficult. <laughs> very difficult because it's practically impossible to imagine a world without tragedies. Right? Uh, what would that look like? Um, but to answer the first part of the question, um, I think that that what a lot of us, and when I say us, I, I just generally mean people that that deal with language, that, that that play with it, that create stories with it, be they journalists or poets or fiction writers or essayists, um, researchers, historians. Um, I think that that what we're all, always trying to do is make sense of of that which still maybe has not a clear contour or shape and often horror and violence don't have a clear contour or shape, right? And they shock us, those things shock, can shock us into immobility, impassivity. Um, and writing is, is one way of responding to, to fear of, and to political violence and to, um, the anxiety of an increasingly disjointed world with increasingly authoritarian governments. And I, um, I think that, that it's not so much like feeding the tra tragedy or feeding ourselves with it. It's more about like trying to articulate it. And it's not that articulating all of it solves anything, but it does help us understand um, and maybe helps us find questions. And maybe also, uh, and this is, I was referring to this in my, in my le brief lecture earlier, 
it gives us like common space, like a common threads, right? So um, we share narrative, narrative tissue amongst us. Uh, we can even disagree better, you know, instead of not understanding each other. We can, we can speak, we can discuss, we can share ideas and dissent or, or consent but uh, but we, we need that common ground and that common ground, the threads of it are language, but the tissue of it is storytelling. Okay, um, thanks for that. Um, there's a question in English coming from an anonymous attendee, but uh, it is actually, it goes to the heart of the uh, topic tonight. So I will um, read that to you. Uh, my question is that, what does Valeria do in her writing process to away didactism, didactism, didactism, I don't even know how you have to pronounce that. The topics she writes might easily turn into lessons or lectures from a rebel woman, yet I never felt she's trying to teach me a world which I have no information before. It is children's in Mexican borders in this case. Yeah, it's obviously he's referring, he or she is referring to Lost Children Archive. How do you avoid uh, teaching when you write fiction? Um, you know, I also, <laughs> it's a question that I ask myself when I teach in general, like how do I avoid, avoid teaching when I'm teaching as well, you know? Like I, I, I teach uh, creative writing and literature and I just don't believe in the, um, and I didn't even go to like Montessori, sorry schools or anything I went to very hierarchical schools with, with nuns that used to like hit us in our hands if we did things and wash our tongues with soap and things like that um, but I I as a as a pedagogue of sorts as a professor here also um, did have a great disbelief uh, in in um, in in the verticality of, of education and I do think that like one, especially writing and literature, one learns doing it, right? One learns engaging with texts. One doesn't learn if, if others tell you how to read something. They, and some, someone might offer you a few categories as a young, as a, I remember as a young uh, student of, um, of philosophy, I studied philosophy in, in the university in Mexico and then comparative literature when I did my PhD. And it was what was always most helpful to me as a student back then was was when teachers or readings through our teachers' classes gave us like critical categories, some like frameworks uh, with which to work. But that was it, you know. That really it was it, and and and the work had to be done on your own and in a self education, right? In in like you yourself really. Uh, engaging with material, thinking, making notes, writing, thinking again, and um, and thus, thus in writing the same thing. You know, I'm not. I, I, I for me, it's very important to to write books that kind of um, show you like bits and pieces, also like of the archive that they use, so that um, the mind of a reader does the hard work, <laughs> does the good work. You know. I hate being told what to think and what to do. And so I definitely try not to do that in my books or in my classes or anything. Excellent. And that's what they're loading in that question, actually, the, the, the, the admiration that you can avoid that. Um, and you do as a writer, obviously. There's a final question, I think. Uh, I don't know if there are any more, but um, the Emre Karabudak asks um, that he, he enjoyed the fact that you, you spoke about Aristoteles as, as our grandfather or, or he, he, he's asking, are there any uh, writers, authors in, in history of literature that you consider as your, as your um, kin, like the greats or, or your, not like your grandfathers? <laughs> Um, and there's another part to the question. They said um, Imre Karabudak and his friends um, uh, in their podcast uh, gave, um, they, they um, broadcast a, a small paragraph from your novel, The Lost Children Archive. And suddenly he wanted to ask you whether 
and um, W.G. Sebald is, is one of your influences in literature, especially in the in the last novel. Mm. Um, yes, I really like Sebald. Um, I I find him extraordinarily boring, but I really like some very boring uh, books, and um, and Sebald is definitely one of them. Um, I could. You know, it's like, a, yeah, it's like a, a voice that, that has this like murmur and it's often just kind of bleak and gray, like a North thing. Yeah, I'm so like, happy you think so, Valeria. I, I was feeling so guilty that I think Sebald is boring. Oh, I'm so happy. But then but but there's, there's a lot of value in boring too, you know, like in, there's, there's these moments of Sebald from out of which... It's like this, yeah, like like this kind of British landscape. Although he's not Brit British, but he, he, I guess, lived there his adult life mostly. And and then suddenly the sun comes out briefly, and it's like such a luminous thing, you know. And and Sebald has these moments. And if you just, if you just hold tight long enough, you get there, and it's they're worthwhile. And I think I've definitely learned a lot from from uh, as a reader, maybe more than as a writer, from from Sebald. Okay. So he didn't um, visit the last book? Not really. I don't know if he's mentioned. He might be mentioned. And I no, no, no, no. I mean, as an uh, sort of influence or, or inspiration. No, yeah. I, I, no, I understood you. Uh, I don't remember. I mean, I don't, okay. I mean, no, the, the answer is no. But mm -hmm. I don't remember if he is mentioned. He might be, he's mentioned in, in other, other, other of my work for sure. Because he's definitely someone that I've read and reread. Um, but and your spiritual grandfathers and the literary greats among the greats or grandmothers? Grandmothers. Uh, I would say, I mean, I don't know if she would like being called a grandmother. She's young still, but um, but Anne Carson uh, yeah. is a, definitely a voice that I am always interested in and trying to learn from. There's a freedom in her writing that I, that I think inspires a lot of writers. Um, and... I am a great admirer of the, I guess this is, this is more a grandfather figure, surely the a Mexican uh, writer, uh, Juan Rulfo, who, who wrote Pedro. Ooh, yeah. I don't know if he's translated well to, to Turkish. Into it's, Turkish, yes, yes. Uh, Juan Rulfo is, is a very... Bad, really bad. Mm, but Rulfo is someone that I think, I reread often, um, I think I read that book at least once a year, often because I teach it or or just because I'm trying to like understand again how to just have so much freedom with respect to form and the management of time. At the end, all novels are about how you manipulate time. And that's the hardest thing always. And I think Rulfo is, is someone that reminds you of your the freedom in, in manipulating time and space. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, but there are many, there are many, many people that I read, we read. I always reread Joseph Brodsky. I always reread the poetry of Emily Dickinson. Um, yeah. Quite a woman after my own heart you are. But <laughs> um, let's, um, I, I wanted to ask you one thing. Um, you said something about Anne Carson, which I really wanted to, you expressed it better than me, the freedom in her writing. That's exactly, what you have in your writing too. That's what I meant in my previous question. You, you, you break the rules of writing fiction. You, you, you innovate them. Mm. Uh, you, there's a freedom in your writing. Um, uh, so thanks for mentioning that about Anne Carson, because I think, mm. what do you think? That, that there is that kind of freedom in your writing as well. Yeah, I think it's, you know, once uh, when I was, much younger, the one of my my favorite Mexican writers was this man. He died a few years ago. Uh, this fantastic writer called Sergio Pitol, and Sergio was also a great translator. He translated uh, from Polish um, and from from German, and I think from Czech. He was a very very he knew a lot of languages and was a brilliant mind. Um, he translated one of the books that was very influential uh, for Lost Children Archive, which is a book mm, by the Polish writer Jerzy Alexander Dziewski. I don't mm -hmm. know if he's, uh, he's read often in 
in Turkish and in, in Turkey, but he's not very well known in, in the Spanish speaking world, except for there's this amazing translation by Pitol. And anyway, Pitol years ago when I was much younger, uh, I remember him saying to me once that, you know, the only thing that you always like, you have to defend as a writer, as a young writer, but as a writer, even when you cease to be young, is is your freedom, your your imaginative freedom, and that means not succumbing to your own to your own uh, belief of expectations and expectations of readers and market. And um, I I do I absolutely um, I, I I really thank having listened heard that when I was so young. And um, I hold it dear to my heart still because I, I don't I wouldn't see the point in continuing to to work in this field if it, it were not with that freedom. Really, what is the point otherwise? You know, I mean, I'd rather I don't know study law and become an amazing lawyer if or if I'm going to write fiction that is that is just following rules and and meeting expectations. Really, what the what for? So I'd rather have another career. Um, than than than this one if it, if it were not for yeah for that freedom that yeah that's great free. Thank you know, you it's, it's, not just, it's not just about oh, I'm gonna be free and independent it's it's, a, it's like a, a deep commitment to to remaining to ensuring that your imagination uh, remains independent or free excellent thank you for that I mean that that commitment to freedom I think makes you a very very radically innovative fiction writer. Um, but to close off, Valeria, I don't know, Yasemin, I, yeah, I, uh, we will, we will I, I will ask Yasemin to close us, uh, to take us out, but can you allow me just a short question? Where are you now? What does life hold for you? What is it like being a Mexican in America at the moment? Hmm. Oh, it's never cool to be a Mexican in America, no matter who is president. Um, I think, you know, I mean, I think of, of, of um, there's always communities that the American psyche bullies particularly, you know, uh, and I think the American psyche bullies the Muslim community uh, brutally and in a different way, the, the next door neighbors, which is Mexico, you know, and I think me Mexicans have, um, I mean, it's a, there's a lot of prejudice around like the Mexican, um, the Mexican identity, the Mexican ethos, and you're always living um, here in kind of um, like ha having having to push against the cultural stereotypes that are what others immediately see of you before you before you even are known, right, or understood by others. Um, and so it's difficult, of course. And I think it's also, I don't know, I, I, what, I, what I find particularly frustrating and painful is seeing the amount of people in the Mexican and also Central American and in general Hispanic community in the USA living very marginally and in on, like under the line of poverty and now for example in the pandemic being considered essential and yet being treated as so disposable right so mm -hmm. you think of like the kind the who are the people here that that um that really are in charge of the basic sustenance of the american people and it's agricultural workers who are mostly mexican and central american undocumented farmers, uh, nurses, and in New York, at least the vast majority of nurses are C Caribbean women, Jamaican and Dominican and Puerto Rican. Um, and if you think of all the delivery uh, service, which became very important mm -hmm. in, the, in the months of complete shutdown in the pandemic, uh, it was fundamentally Mexican men and their bicycles, like they ride with the chains I don't know if you if you remember the image of Emiliano Zapata, mm -hmm. um, but Emiliano Zapata uh, always carries two cartridge belts like this, and his his uh, yeah his exactly 
Mexican delivery men always ride with the chains of the bicycles chained twice around them like this, just so they can ride properly without the chain being bulky. But they always remind me of, <laughs> of these zapatas, no? Or, <laughs> Like, uh, really, I mean, you, if you see my street right now, it's just full of snow, but you'll see the Mexican delivery man riding their bicycles to deliver things. Yeah, they're all Zapatistas. And you have snow in Europe, in New York. Yes, great. No, that's right now. So, Thank so you. I mean, that, that community is one that deserves more visibility. Exactly. And, yeah. And you've done wonders, of course, for that visibility. And uh, thank you for all those great novels and good luck with the new apparently partly historical one and over to Yasemin now to to take us out I think yes and yeah before we do that before we wrap up and say goodbye um I I would like to mention Seda again Seda Ersavji because she kind of waved and and and said that she's here among the audience I don't know if you saw her note and of I, course, I, I wish, uh, yes, I wish we could go to dinner now <laughs> after this. <laughs> as, as I, it's really wonderful because, uh, as I said before, she translates you from, she used to translate you from Spanish and now she translates you from English. And I did read, uh, I think, your first book or one of the first books, Sidewalks in, in Spanish. And my Spanish is very broken, but I, I, I still, you know, made an effort to, to enjoy it. And then and then I, I read you in English and then I started also reading you in Turkish. Uh, very often with writers, uh, when you know them in their own, uh, you know, in their mother tongue, in their own, in the language they write in, when they're translated, there's something lost, something missing. And that there's just like a distance um, uh, you know, that, that there is with the text uh, for the reader who has uh, known the writer in, in, in, in, the, in the first language. Uh, not with you, and we owe this to Seda, I think. So this, that's, that's really great. But I also want to ask you about language and Nilufer, Nilufer uh, referred to that earlier. I know you said somewhere that language or, or the fact that you were in between languages, you know, this linguistic dissonance, this, this dissonance of language is, is, is a marker of your identity. And I want to ask about that uh, in particular. Why are you now writing in English? Will you always write in English from now on? Uh, why did you try to write in Spanish and why did you perhaps quit? And also, you know, how do you define your identity? And I'm not, or maybe that's not the right question because I'm not into definitions um, so much because I know how limiting they can be. What perhaps, what are the markers of your identity? You know, what, how do you kind of define yourself or how do you find uh, the, the, some of the defining characteristics in you as a person and also as a writer? Yeah, I don't, I don't intend to, to write in, in English and here, here for, I, um, I, I just will write in whatever language um, allows me to explore what I want to explore at that moment, right? And um, I was back in Mexico um, at some point for a few weeks. And well, while I was there, I was only able to write in Spanish. And then I came back here and, and I think, I mean, you, one inhabits a linguistic community. So also it's, it's sometimes um, complicated to, um, yeah, to, to, to write in the language that you're not living in, unless the writing project uh, really um, forces you to. And I remember, for example, when I wrote the story of my teeth, um, at that point I was writing, I was writing, trying to write another novel in English, a novel about growing up in South Africa during the 1990s and post-apartheid South Africa. And uh, I wasn't quite, really managing to write the novel. And then I was commissioned this, this, uh, this um, project, which then became a novel later, and a novel called The Story of My Teeth. And it was to write about, um, about the putting together an exhibition in the Humex um, collection. Humex collection is owned by the Humex factory and it's a juice factory. 
uh, the Jugos Mexicanos, Jumex. And so I was very interested in this idea that this juice factory um, bought a bunch of artwork and had this huge uh, contemporary art collection. And I was interested in the like opinion of the workers in the factory uh, and their, their opinion of, of the art that the Humex collection had and what they thought of the fact that their work ultimately bought this art. And so I was really interested in, in, in the dialogue with them. And so I wrote that novel in weekly installments, sending uh, chapters uh, to a group of workers who volunteered to read weekly and they would read out loud and then they would criticize it. They would sometimes very brutal criticism and then they would suggest things and talk about their stories. And, and then they would record all that in an MP3 file and send it back to me. And then I would write the next installment. And that's how the novel was written in this kind of exchange or dialogue between that group of workers. And that was obviously in Spanish, even though, you know, like it had to be in Spanish. But that was the only novel that I wrote in a language in a way that the circumstances were forcing me or dictating that I, I just couldn't write it in English. These were Mexican factory workers. Every other novel I've written or book I've written um, confronts me with the question of like, what language are you going to write me in? You know, and, and it takes me a long time to figure that out. I often procrastinate for about a year um, just writing notes in both languages until one one language takes over and so I, I don't I don't I can't programmatically say now I'm going to be writing in English or now only in Spanish it just it's something that I have to ask myself with each new project okay uh, so what's next for you what is next is um, uh, very slowly a uh, a little a novel something I don't know yet what it's how it's going to I don't know it has a title maternity leave but it's I don't know uh, it's I, I I'm writing it almost as as distilling something so it's very very very very slow and and who knows what will happen and then the the project the bigger project that I'm working on right now is this is this sound project called for now echoes of the borderlands and um it's what I was talking about earlier, uh, just a sound, like a sound essay, a sonic piece that lasts 24 hours. Of course, you don't have to sit and listen to the 24 hours in one go, but 24 hours is the amount of time that it takes to drive from one extreme of the Mexico-US border to the other extreme, mm -hmm. so from Tijuana, San Diego, to the Gulf of Mexico, Brownsville, Texas. And so it's written in kind of 24 sections that deal with different um, different aspects of the history of violence in the region, like mining, but it's told in many different voices. And what you heard at the beginning of this is is um, is something related to that, because I mean it's not all a lot of a lot of the pieces archival sound from the border. Um, the person that I'm working with, one of the one of the musicians that I'm working with, is a really interesting musician who has been collecting sounds for 25 years. In fact, he came to me because he read my novel. And he reached out to me. He's friends of friends and uh, has been working with film, music and film for many, many years. And he, he, he got in contact with me and said, yeah, I am, I am the, the guy in your novel. Well, we have to speak. Now we're working together on this project. So in a way, strange way, I'm like, I am somehow embodying the characters in the novel now going to the border to, to record sounds. Um, and he records, for example, everything from like the thorn of a saguaro, like a, from a cactus, to wind in the Chiricama Mountains, to a conversation with the um, police or, well, the Border Patrol, and then makes music, but not like crazy experimental music that you hate to listen to, but like actual something that's in a way melodious and interesting. And so we're putting together the sound piece um, with archive, archival sound from the border and like many layers of narrative about, about that, the history of that space. But it's not a historical, it's not like a pedagogical tool or, or a historical piece either. I mean, it's, it's somewhere between fiction and nonfiction, I guess. That's fascinating. Yeah, I mean, there's a last question on the list. Do you want to take it? Uh, yeah, which are we looking at? Oh. Actually, there are more questions. Um, the final. 
There's Is one in the chat box and one in Q&A and then one comment in Q&A. About the story of my teeth. Yeah, let me just, uh, I think I skipped uh, this comment and question from Özcan D. Let me just read that uh, very quickly. Uh, should we separate from each other the writer, the artist and the work, the artist with, with a bad life story, for example? This is, uh, I think, more of a comment than question, but what do you think? I mean, should we like not read um people who have been assholes in their uh, in their personal lives. I, I don't think so. I think we should. I mean, I, I don't know. I, I, first of all, how much of literature would you have to throw away if, um, if you were to simply not engage with it because of the moral, um, moral concerns that are often moral concerns of a specific age, you know? I mean, you have to think about like also the, the, the larger arcs, <clears throat> arcs of history and, and what seems, um, yeah, I don't know. I think we have to think with a historicist mind as well, not to justify anybody's horrible actions, but to, to place them in context. But then ultimately, should we do this? Should we do that? Not do whatever you want to. I'm not going to tell you what to do. Uh, <laughs> I read whoever I want to. <laughs> There's actually at present a Me Too explosion in Turkey in the world of literature. So the question of whether we should read the works of, of, of male um, abusers is, is a very hot question in Turkey at the moment. Well, I think they should be condemned for their moral uh, of course, for their actions, definitely. And I think Me Too has been a very, very powerful tool for women because collectivity has been the only way in which we can be heard because individuals and individual women get systematically silenced and not believed. And, um, you know, be it that they go to the police or to other people. And it's, there's, always, there's always a sense that you're pretty alone as a woman when you denounce um, sexual and emotional violence. Uh, so collectivity has been the tool, you know, and I think it's, it's, an, it's an interesting one and a powerful one. I don't think, however, that people should not be read. I, I, I, as I said again, I will read whoever, <laughs> whoever I want to, and I don't want anyone to tell me if I can or cannot read them. You know, it's, it's, such, a personal, it's such a personal choice, just do whatever you want to. Okay. Okay. One last question. This is from uh, Bora Osanmas, and I'll translate that for you. He says, in, in, in the history of my teeth, uh, you have a lead character who is a fibber. And if you ask me, this character uh, is, is very familiar uh, to us uh, in this country, uh, um, practicing the art of survival. Do you think, uh, like in life itself, that we find in literary fiction uh, the stories, um, the old stories, stories that have already been told um, in new forms and shapes and, and in a way, in a, in a repetitive way? And, and then he says, uh, looking at the world through your filter is... is, is um, rejuvenating and and uh, liberating and and he wanted to emphasize that well thank you <laughs> i should say i'm not sure what to end i'm not not sure i understood the question part of, of the, the same thing. stories keep repeating in fiction through oh, history okay. over and over again is yeah, that like so the fiber character you know he it it is a very familiar character and you can see such characters in real life or in other stories, of course? Um, yeah, I think they do, no, right? There's like archetypes that, that we keep on having to, to re, um, I mean, sometimes explore again or sometimes like deconstruct and, and, and understand um, again in a different time. You know, um, if we think of, uh, think of like the character of Ulysses, uh, or Odysseus of, um, of Homer's um, uh, Odyssea. I, you know, I read, I read 
that Ulysses as a, as a heroic, epic character, all through my 20s as I was a student, young student of philosophy, it was only really like after, especially when I read, it was only like way after, and especially not, not reading Homer, but reading um, Seneca's version of the woman of Troy, the Troades, um, that I realized he's, a, he's, a, he's basically a woman trafficker. You know, he's a sexual slave trafficker, Ulysses. And that's our, that's our hero. That's a hero of Western civilization. What he does to the woman of Troy is after they've destroyed Troy, he takes all the women of Troy as captives to be given out to his to his buddies, to his um, Greek buddies, no? And, um, and that is a hero in our culture. So, I mean, I think we, of course, have to, like, return to the archetypes and heroes of literature and frankly also rewrite them or de deconstruct them and understand who who we are um how we what kind of narratives we are we are perpetuating sometimes mindlessly <laughs> excellent answer <laughs> yes and right thank you that thought, i think yeah we we should Thank you very much, Valeria, for this very special evening, for this wonderful conversation. And on behalf of everyone at the Istanbul Literature House, let me invite you once again to the house when you can actually travel to Istanbul and uh, to be with us face to face in our small rooms in the house and uh, to continue this conversation. Yeah, I would and like to say also just to the also, I mean, if to the young female writers who are maybe involved or not, in the Me Too's in, in, um, in Istanbul and in Turkey more generally, that if they have not seen the work of Las Tesis, this uh, Chilean group of young women, I, I know it, it arrived in Istanbul because I remember seeing a video of Las Tesis in Istanbul, uh, but uh, I'll, I don't know how to, how to message everyone. Let's see, chat to, oh, I can't. From chat, yeah. So it's it's uh, I recommend you to see a video of last. Can you can you send this to everyone? This is Yankee. I don't know who's Yan who Yankee. Mm. Send chat to. You can send it to all panelists. I cannot. To co-host panelists, panelists, panelists. No. Panelists and at attendees. At, at the bottom of the chat box. You can just send a message to all panelists and attendees. Oh, oh, panelists and attendees. I get it. Yes, Las Tesis. Um, wait, let me send you the right video. Uh, Las Tesis. And I wonder if, I think it's this one. Yeah, it's this one. Um, and then also a very, powerful um, song by, by the Mexican singer songwriter called Vivir Quintana. And she, she wrote a song that has become a bit of a, really an anthem uh, in Mexico City and in collective. Writing's not that easy. Oh, sorry, what? that's a YouTube. Um, and this is Vivir Quintana. I think there might be a translation of this somewhere. This is in Spanish, but please do this. This sec, this song is a very powerful song about um, about um, femicide and violence against women in Mexico. And the first one is um, about about uh, violence against women more generally. What is tercer curcular? That That's, means thank you. Have oh, you seen okay. yourself in Turkish? Have they sent you the book? Yes, I have. I have a, a copy of the book. Great, yeah. wonderful. Thank you so much. Over to Yasemin to say goodbye. Thank you so much, Valeria. Thank you. Yasemin, so. Goodbye and Iyak Shamlar, everyone. Thank you so much, Valeria. See you soon. Thank you, everybody. Be well. Bye. Take care. Bye. Happy New Year. See you too, Nilufer. Bye, Yasemin. Goodbye. Bye.